a game changer has happened. We'll talk about it this hour. Now humans are developing even bigger powers than ever before. We are really acquiring divine powers of creation and destruction. We are really upgrading humans into gods. We are acquiring, for instance, the, the power to re-engineer life. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan visits with Pastor Brandon Holdhouse about some significant current event happenings. What are the deeper implications and even some biblical implications of the Nord Stream pipeline destruction? How might the nation of Israel play into this scenario? That and much more this hour. Here is today's programming. When you hear Harari speak, his words are antichrist-esque. He speaks like a dragon. The things that he wants to do sounds familiar, very familiar, with eventually what the antichrist will do in the future. Although he is not the antichrist, he definitely has the spirit of antichrist or the spirit of lawlessness working through him. We can definitely see with his evil ideas, the same kind of evil ideas that the Antichrist would have. It is on that same level, basically to enslave humanity. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio. Yeah, we've had a couple of clips that are a little bit ominous, all right, and we're going to cover a couple of different topics and perhaps even more than that this hour with my guest, Pastor Brandon Holthouse. And last time, he was on air and in person in the Twin Cities. We looked at that time at the emerging New World Order, and that has only escalated. A major player in this whole One World scenario, again, is Yuval Noah Harari. I'm going to play a couple of additional clips of this man as he has the attention, let's just say, of world leaders, starting with Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. And you heard him open the program saying, we will make humans into gods. But these globalists have no use for the true God of this world. They detest the creator of the universe. Now, one more addition here, because we've kind of had a game changer on the global scale, and that would be the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipelines. We'll talk about that as well. Actually, I saw a headline on Fox News online very recently. It said, global chaos reigns. How true that is. So might get to a couple of other topics as well, but let me bring on Pastor Brandon Holthouse, Senior Pastor Rock Harbor Church in Bakersfield, California, and he does regular prophecy updates online. Church messages are available online. We'll say more about that into the program. Brandon, welcome back to the program. Hi, Jan. Thanks for having me. It's always an honor to be on your show. Brandon, I think the first thing I want to do, and we got a lot to cover this hour, but you gave an update that caught my attention, and I think it was either titled or you introduced the update as, The World Has Fundamentally Changed. And you went on to say, folks, we're not going back to normal. Quite frankly, we have a lot of listeners who really assume that we are. Why don't you summarize what you said sure. in that update? Because I think it was important and I think it was timely. Folks need to hear your opinion here. I think there's some misnomer out there. And the misnomer is we're going to have a great revival and everything's going to turn back to God and everything's going to be put right. And that's the opposite of what the Bible predicts about the church age. I understand people don't want to have to embrace that things are really running down and getting to the point of no return, but that's the reality. So what I did in that broadcast is I tried to explain, look, it's not just one thing that's going down the tubes. It's a myriad of major things going down that we just don't come back from. If they destroy our economy, if they move us to a digital currency, if we go to a regional government, and there's rumors right now about us going to some regional government with Canada, Mexico, and America because of the illegal immigration. You just go through every piece of the puzzle, whether it's Israel, the globalists, the technology. They are doing things, Jan, that you just don't come back from. You cross lines. Think about this line morally, where they're chopping body parts off of children, right. mutilating them. 
you don't come back from that morally once you go there. So my thing was in my prophecy update, it's going down according to plan. God said this is how the church would end, would have a remnant, but it also the society and the church at large would go down the tubes. It's a hard reality. I think the term we're hearing so much about is this term, things are going woke, wokeism, et cetera. I don't think that term even existed five years ago. How would you define that? Because it's entered the church, and we might even get to that in some of our discussion. But when it enters the church, it's something that Christians need to better understand. Can you give a definition for wokeism? Sure. Wokeism, how I call it, is lawlessness. And what I mean by that is when the scripture says the Antichrist comes in lawlessness, lawlessness is not anarchy. Lawlessness means the opposite of what God says. So God says this is right. Wokeism says, no, this is wrong. And when God says this is wrong, wokeism says this is right. It's a classic Isaiah 5 passage. So what is wokeism? Wokeism really is a religion. All false religions come from the whore of Babylon, but it is a new religion that is taking the place of Christianity in Western society. And it has its own priesthood. It has its own sacrifices. It has its own gods. Some of those gods are globalists like Yuval Harari and Klaus Schwab, and the big god that they worship is planet Earth. When you look at this, it has its own enemies. It has its evil ones, which are you and me yeah. and every Christian out there. We're the problems. And it even has its own eschatology in the sense that if we don't do something to save the planet, we're all going to die. When you look at wokeism, it's a religion, and it has entered the church through syncretism. And now we have all these pastors and churches that are woke. That's the irony, Brandon, and that's the tragedy, and that's what my listeners are dealing with some anyway. And it seemed to happen after the George Floyd incident here in my hometown of Minneapolis suddenly, and then the churches were closed for a while because of COVID, and then when they opened, I started hearing from dozens of people, my church is now woke. It seemed to be focusing more again on social justice rather than the gospel. I'm talking now about how it's affecting the church. Most of my listeners are mostly concerned about how things are affecting their spiritual life, their church, their pastor, etc. And you're a pastor. I'm sure you hear the same thing. My church wasn't woke five, ten years ago. All of a sudden, I went back and one day, and it was. Yeah, and something happened during the shutdowns. That's what was the catalyst for a lot of this wokeism to infiltrate these pastors who were isolated, I guess, by themselves. And the devil worked on them, and they come back now, and then salvation is not through Jesus Christ. Salvation is through social justice. And you have this idea of corporate salvation now, if we all work together to create peace and security. So I don't know what happened during the shutdowns, but something spiritually went wrong because everyone I talked to, they would say, I don't know what happened. My pastor came back into the pulp, and all of a sudden he's woke and apologizing for his white privilege. I wanted all of us to repent of our white privilege. So something happened, Jan, during that shutdown. Something spiritually damaging happened. Folks, you need the video, I think, Enemies Within the Church, which we carry, and I didn't make this statement just to try to make a sale, but what Brandon and I are talking about is pretty well explained in the DVD, Enemies Within the Church. You can find that in my online store. You can call my office. I've done multiple programs on it. I think it offers an explanation for some of what's happened, perhaps not all. Brandon, I'm just moving on just in the interest of time because I opened the program with a very short 20-second clip of Yuval Noah Harari, and then I played a little clip of you talking about Mr. Harari, and I'd like to play, this is just 40 seconds of this gentleman. I want to talk about it, and then from there we're going to move on to some other things, including what I think is a game-changer for the whole world that happened a week ago or so. We'll get to this Nord Stream situation at that time, but first, folks, I just feel we need to help you better understand and better get acquainted This man is an Israeli. He is very self-proclaimed atheist, Mr. Harari. And here he's making a statement because, again, he's a globalist, and the globalists think that they're going to find eternal life, of course, apart from God, Jehovah God. We don't have any answer in the Bible what to do when humans are no longer useful to the economy. You need completely new ideologies, completely new religions, and they are likely to emerge from Silicon Valley or from Bangalore and not from uh, uh, the Middle East. And they are likely to, pro- to give people visions based on technology 
everything that the old religions promised, uh, happiness and justice and even eternal life, but here on earth with the help of technology and not after death with the help of some supernatural being. Brandon, astounding comments here. We're going to have eternal life apart from any supernatural being. Another clip, he's going to even emphasize that even more. The problem is he's got the ear of very important people. Some of the strongest movers and shakers on the planet are listening to this Mr. Yuval Noah Harari, and he's basically saying, we got to get the population down. We're going to have eternal life, but apart from God. Give me your take on it. You speak about this fellow. This guy has sold over 40 million books. That's huge. And so there is a lot of people listening to him, particularly Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. And in fact, most leaders around the world have listened to him. Even Obama champions him and other people in the European Union. So what's really going on here? This guy, I call him the oracle for the beast government. What I mean by that is he is telling you what they're going to do and how they're going to shape our society with this new idea of a technocratic system. Because this guy wants to hack us. He wants to prevent us from what he calls fake news. And to him, fake news, I'll give you an example. He says that the resurrection is fake news. He says that the Bible is fake news. So he wants to eventually implant things in us that prevents us from believing these so-called fake news or any other thing that goes against the globalist agenda. So if you want to know what they're doing and what they're thinking, this guy is the brainchild. And they are implementing pretty much every thought he has. The idea of useless humans, what are we going to do? Well, the problem with the globalists is they have a thing called depopulation. They do want to depopulate the planet. And that's his thing. What are we going to do with all these useless humans? In another clip, he says, well, I guess we'll give them drugs and video games. This is evil, and this is the way they look at life and humans because they think they're the gods now. They will be the gods that tell us what to do. And I think I've heard you say somebody like this, he's clearly a forerunner of the Antichrist. We're not saying he's the Antichrist. We don't know who that character is going to turn out to be, and Christians are never going to meet him, thankfully. But this guy, he wants to lead a digital dictatorship. I think that's what stands out to me. He sees salvation through technology. I'm going to play one more clip of him, and here he says the biggest game changer that he has seen is that we can now monitor people under the skin. Well, you think about that for a few minutes, folks. We've had some issues with, we're not going to name it right now, but things going on under the skin here for a couple of years. People could look back in a hundred years and identify the coronavirus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over, especially surveillance under the skin, which I think is maybe the most important development of the 21st century, is this ability to hack human beings, to go under the skin, collect biometric data, analyze it, and understand people better than they understand themselves. This, I believe, is maybe the most important event of the 21st century. Maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing they will remember from the COVID crisis is this is the moment when everything went digital. And if this, is, this was the moment when every, everything became monitored. That we agreed to be surveyed all, all the time, not just in authoritarian machines, but even in democracies. And maybe most importantly at all, this was the moment when surveillance started going under the skin. Because really, we haven't seen anything yet. I, I think that the big process that's happening right now in the world is uh, hacking human beings, the ability to hack humans, to understand deeply what's happening within you, what, what, makes, you, what, what, what makes you go. For that, the most important data is not what you read and who you meet and what you buy, it's what's happening inside your body. So we had these two big revolutions, the computer science revolution, or the infotech revolution, and the revolution in the biological sciences. And they are still separate, but they are about to merge. They are merging around, I would say, the biometric sensor. It's the thing, it's the gadget, it's the technology that converts biological data into digital data that can be analyzed by computers. 
And having the ability to really monitor people under the skin, this is the, the biggest game changer of all. Folks, understand this is the brains behind the World Economic Forum. This is the brains behind the globalist agenda, the globalist leaders. This is who they listen to. And Brandon Holthouse, he's basically saying humans are a piece of software that you can hack into. Yeah, and you think about how antichrist-esque that is to look at humans not made in the image of God, but just animals. That's why when people listen to him, they could hear the voice of the Antichrist, because to think humans are just hackable animals that we can control, that is very satanic to think like that. But he's not afraid to put it out there. What we have to understand is this is how influential it is on officials in the U.S. government and Canada and Western society. They're all listening to him and thinking this way. So here's the thing. They want the ultimate control. And he just said it on that clip. And even when I was studying prophecy a long time ago, beyond what I even imagined, I understood the Antichrist will control people from the outside, but I did not understand the concept of controlling people on the inside until now with technology. And that brings a whole new level of control, that they can control what we're thinking or how our feelings are, and then monitor us and penalize us for things like that. That's way beyond what I even imagined. So now it's setting the stage that the Antichrist will not only control you from the outside, he will control you from the inside. That's pretty scary. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Bakersfield, California, Pastor Brandon Holthouse. You can learn more at rockharborchurch.net, rockharborchurch.net. Be sure to sign up for his various prophecy updates. All of his messages are online as well. Brandon, again, just in the interest of time and because so much news is breaking all the time. I'm transitioning a little bit here. And folks, we just shared with you a few minutes here about somebody who, again, we're acknowledging that he's a terribly evil human being. But the point is that the world's globalists, the one-worlders, look to people like this because he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. But he's very much a God-hater. He believes that we're going to live forever but that is without God. It's probably through technology and other means. And you heard Jared Kushner last week state that he felt that he would be the generation that would live forever. So this is the way a certain subset of people are thinking today. Brandon, I'm moving in the interest of time into a current event, and we need to talk about it, and we need to give more of a biblical spin to what has happened, and that is a couple of the pipelines that are obviously providing natural gas to, I think, almost all of Europe were sabotaged with explosives, and both of us have been trying to look into it as much as possible. And first, before we even get into the discussion, I want to play what Mr. Biden said about the Nord Stream pipeline. He gave an ominous warning about this pipeline. Now, remember, folks, that what has happened is not going to inconvenience millions of people. It may actually cause the demise of millions of people because they're not going to get their sufficient heating in the coming winter. If Russia invades... uh... That means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again. Then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. It, we, we will bring an end to it. What do, what, how, will you, how will you do that exactly since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will... Uh, I promise you we'll be able to do it. So, Brandon, I don't know that we will ever know who actually perpetrated this atrocity, which is, again, not going to just inconvenience millions, could actually kill millions because they're not going to get sufficient heating in the coming winter or several coming winters. And I know you've looked into this, and this comment by Mr. Biden is terribly ominous. Give me your thoughts. Yeah, it's one of those things I think I talked to you off air about. Did he let something slip that he wasn't supposed to? We understand Biden's mental condition, and something like that could definitely slip out of his mouth to where he hinted towards, hey, something's going to be done. Again, that's why Russia's blaming America and the West for doing something like this. Again, we don't know at this point in time, but why would he say something like that? And then the reporters say, how are you going to do this? And, oh, we'll just do it. But here's the thing that we do know, the depth of these pipes— It's not about a frogman going underwater and doing a demolition. This had to be done 
at a level of 260 to 360 feet, and frogmen only operate under 20 feet. So it was a submersible vehicle that went there and planted these explosions, and that pipeline is encased in concrete. So Sweden State Broadcast Network cited from the Swedish National Seismic Network that there was powerful underwater explosions and 30 different Swedish monitoring stations picked up on it. So it was definitely man-made. It was not a natural leak or something happened. They said it was no doubt a blast. And so we know someone did a demolition. But this is the key thing. And I heard Glenn Beck talk about this, Jen. This is a non-military key infrastructure that was destroyed. This is beyond just conventional warfare. This is on the level of like terrorism where you affect civilians. And if Europe doesn't get this gas, they will freeze to death this winter. And that's the problem is it's going to cost so many civilian lives because of this. Brandon, you said to me this puts Israel in the crosshairs. Why don't you explain what you mean by that? When you ask the question, who stands to gain from this type of action and who stands to lose? Well, the interesting thing is you go back in Bible prophecy and you say, the issue is always Israel in Bible prophecy. So how does this affect Israel? Israel, as you know, and all the listeners know, found in 2009 large natural gas reserves, about 311 billion cubic meters off their coast. And the reserves are so rich for Israel that they not only can supply their own country, but they can supply Europe as well. Well, just as of late, in June of 2022, Israel and the European Union signed a natural gas agreement. And that agreement says that Israel will send its gas through Egypt's pipelines up into Europe. The reason Europe did this, obviously, because of the Ukrainian war, right? And it was a solution for them to replace the Russian gas imports that they had relied on for 37 years. I don't know how they got away with all that, but that's what it was for. So then it puts Israel in many ways in the crosshairs of Russia or anyone else that's supplying gas to the European Union. Because this pipeline was a major leg of Russia's leverage on Europe and Germany, and it lost its leverage because of this. So now Putin is going to go crazy on this. He is going to seek revenge and he's going to try to take out probably anyone that's helping Europe in this situation. And again, this guy's on a war path to have total world domination. Now, if we bring prophecy into this, if we're in that time, the last days, and I believe we are, could this lead up to a Gog of Magog war? And this is possibly one of the hooks in the jaw? Maybe. It very well may pull Putin down into attacking Israel. I don't know, but there's definitely some overtones prophetically about this. Couldn't agree with you more. And I think as we look at world events, again, as you said, we need to put them in the perspective of how does this affect Israel? How does this affect what the Bible says will happen in the last days? And of course, that all revolves heavily around the nation of Israel. We know there's outlined Ezekiel 38:39, a Gog Magog war and the nation to the uttermost north of Israel, which I believe is Russia, is going to want to seize a spoil, want to seize the wealth of Israel at this point in time. I think what looks very good to Vladimir Putin or even his successor would be the gas wealth that's in the Mediterranean that would be available to somebody who wants to seize that kind of wealth. But as you said, Brandon, this makes Putin far more dangerous. And that's what is so ominous here. And I think whoever did this, I don't know if they thought about that, but he is way more dangerous now. Putin has just come out threatening nuclear weapons. And I think people need to take him seriously. He's not saber rattling. He even said, I am not bluffing. If you guys continue to push me, I'm thinking about nukes. Well, people have to understand what's really happening over there. It's the globalists versus Putin, really. It's what's happening. The globalists can't stand Putin because he stands in the way of globalism. Now, here's a weird thing. He was trained by Klaus Schwab, and then he apparently turned on the World Economic Forum because he's not a globalist, right? I don't know if he went in there just to figure out what they're thinking and what they're planning to do, but he's definitely not on the globalist trail. So this issue of Ukraine and what's happening in that area is an issue of globalism versus Russian nationalism. And the main idea behind Putin and what he's doing comes from Dugin. Alexander Dugin is the brainchild for Putin. 
as we talked about Harari being the brainchild for Klaus Schwab and the globalist, Dugan is the brainchild. And in Dugan's mind, he speaks into Vladimir's ear about revenge and about establishing a Russian state to control the entire world. They absolutely hate the West. They want to destroy the West. And here's the funny thing, Jam. They hate wokeism. Yes. They hate globalism. So when you look at that, and I'm not a Russian sympathizer at all, but this is part of their Russian nationalism where they're definitely opposed to the values and goals of the globalist system. And so I think if people just think in those terms, they'll have a better idea of really what's going on there and how this plays out. It's interesting. What I've said in some of my prophecy updates is you could be seeing a war between the two legs of Daniel's metallic man of Rome. Rome basically has five stages predicted in prophecy. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Revelation 13 indicates there's five stages to the Roman Empire. First one was the United stage in Jesus' day. Right now we're in the two-legged phase. And if you do a little history, Jan, what you'll find out is the western side of the Roman Empire moved up into Charlemagne and then through Otto I into Germany. When Constantinople was taken on the eastern leg, the nobles and scholars and princes all moved into the area of Russia. And so what a lot of scholars who watch this will say is that the two legs of Daniel's metallic man, one is standing in Russia and the other one is standing in the area of Germany or Western Europe. And so if this is the case that this is a battle between the two legs, I already know who wins. Mm -hmm. The globalists win. Because we move, the next phase is a global government in Daniel's metallic man. And then you have the 10 toes, obviously, and then ending with the Antichrist. That's a bigger perspective. And I think that's how people need to get a grasp of really what's going on there. We're getting ready to move into a global government. So I know because the Bible says it, who wins? Putin loses eventually and the globalists take over. Yeah, and talk to Pastor Brandon Holthouse, Rock Harbor Church in Bakersfield, California. I'm going to take a midpoint break here. When I get back, we're going to talk a little bit about the sin of silence. And I'll explain that when I get back, because I think what I'm ultimately going to ask in part two of my programming is, is your church talking about some of the things we've just discussed here this first half hour of my program? Or maybe would your church consider this bad news? It won't bring church members into the church, etc., which means they're not really preaching the whole counsel of God. It's something that Brandon Holthouse and I talk about frequently, but there are many fine churches out there who are holding to truth, but then there are many who've gone somewhat haywire. That's why I just recommended when I opened the program, you need to see the video, Enemies Within the Church, what's happened in the last, say, 30 years. So I'm coming back in just a couple of minutes, and we're going to continue on with my discussion, and I'm going to ask, what is the sin of silence? We'll get to that in just a minute. Don't go away. When was the last time in your church, you heard the pastor speak on Bible prophecy. Some churches went 20, 30, 10, 15 years, the pastor's not mentioned anything about Bible prophecy. When was the last time your pastor discussed the Messianic Kingdom, the thousand year rule of Christ? When was the last time you heard a sermon on the Antichrist or the false prophet? When was the last time you heard about the great apostasy of the church, which is happening right in front of our very eyes? When was the last time your Bible study discussed the end times? When was the last time your church invited a guest speaker to teach on the end times subjects? The teaching of prophecy is at an all-time low, which at a time where the most activities are happening. Welcome back. Well, that was a sad commentary there by my guest for the hour, Brandon Holthouse, but it is true. It is. It is. <laughs> it's a sad reality. Sad reality. Well, another reality is we just had in the last few days another one of our Understanding the Times events last Thursday. Pastor Billy Crone came to Revive Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, suburb of Minneapolis. Of course, we live stream those events to the entire world. And we do have a DVD available, and we talked about some of the very things we're discussing this hour, plus a lot more. Just give us three or four days to edit the video of our program with Pastor Billy Crone. The video posting and DVD will be available early next week. It's also available on our website. Just go to olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org, and go to video. And my goodness, we have a wonderful turnout, and we have tens of thousands. Actually, over a week or two, we're going to get 
couple hundred thousand views from our online audience, as we did with my guest for this hour, Pastor Brandon Holthouse. He was with us live in Minneapolis back in April. I want to read an email, and I teased with this in my first half, and it's kind of a sad email, but some of you will identify with it. I'm not going to name the person who wrote it because I don't have permission, but they write this. I appreciate your ministry because the church and area where I live just does not talk about anything that's going on in the world, including end time issues. And the writer says, I feel increasingly lonely as a Christian, even though I am a member of a mega church and serve in ministry in the church. The fellowship has dwindled to a very little to very few, and I don't understand why. So they write, I do not receive any encouragement or meaningful conversation from believers I attend the church with. And they conclude, I seem to have different, perhaps a biblical worldview than some of these other church attenders. Believers here live as though everything is all right and that it's up to someone else to solve all the troubling issues our country is experiencing. And then he concludes, I just feel so alone and I feel like there's no one I can talk to. Again, this particular writer is from a megachurch. Does not have anybody in the church to talk to, at least about some of the issues that we feel matter today? So when I read that, I said, well, I think I'm going to talk to my guest for the hour, Brandon Holthouse, about that. Brandon, you get similar emails like this. Give me your thoughts on the one you just heard. It's unfortunately part of the normal emails we get. It saddens my heart, and this is the phenomenon that's going on, that the majority of churches will refuse to talk about current events. They refuse to talk about prophecy or even teach from a book of prophecy. So they cherry pick through the Bible in order to avoid prophecy. And again, there are a lot of reasons why they don't, and I can enumerate them, but the situation that your writer emailed you with is so common, and that's why it prompted us to start a church tracker that people could go to online and find a remnant church that actually will talk about prophecy and current events. And you've actually come up with about 1,400 churches. I can't imagine how busy your staff must be just to gather all this information and to check out the recommendations to make sure these 1,400 churches are relatively solid and all. You call them remnant churches and you have a tracker on your website rockharborchurch.net. Give us just a little background how this all came about. Because of those types of emails that you just received, we were getting them as well. And basically we said, wouldn't it be nice to be able to identify some of these churches that are remnant churches that are like-minded to help these people out? So we talked to somebody in our church that had the ability to design an app for it. And then once he got it established and we got our new website, we put it into effect. And then I devoted three staff members to really honing this in. And what they're doing is, we started with the churches that we know. From then on, people started contacting us saying, hey, I'm part of a remnant church, and we vetted them, and we were able to put them on our church tracker. And over the course of five, six months, we ended up with 1,400 churches, and we actually have people on the ground scouting the churches out for us now. And they'll come back and say, yeah, he's not pro-Israel or he doesn't agree with their statement of faith that's online. So that's been really remarkable that we can use people to scout out these areas. But we're continuing to grow it. And now we can say to people, well, check this area out and see if there's one there. You might have to drive a couple hours, but it'll be worth it. And we've talked about this before, and we actually did a program. We did this originally three years ago called Prophecy Derangement Syndrome. You and Tom Hughes and I did an hour, actually replayed that the following year. So it's twice we've aired Prophecy Derangement Syndrome, which basically much of the church, not all, we certainly have some that are holding to truth in the whole council of the Bible. But the point is, some are committing what you said to me privately a day or two ago. They're committing the sin of silence. In other words, They're not talking about everything that's going to equip the believer to cope with our times. Now, you and I talked for the first half of the program here, today's Understanding the Times Radio, we talked about some very troubling things from this Yuval Noah Harari, who's very antichrist-esque, as we've already said, 
moved on to some of the sabotage that's going to put millions of Europeans at risk here this coming winter and in the future because of the Nord Stream situation. And yet again, we've got some churches, and you tipped me off, and I've read it before, what you said is true. So many churches are focusing on numbers, they're focusing on numerical growth. Add to that the fact the seminaries have dropped some of the issues that we talk about on this program. And then, as you said to me off air as well, so many churches are following the purpose-driven principle, which really stresses mainly numbers and would keep people away from hearing let's just say some inconvenient truth. So you take it from there because to me and to you, this is the sin of silence. It is. And I think that's the best way to codify what's going on because there's multiple reasons why, but whatever the reason is, and I'll enumerate them right now, but whatever their reasons are, it is the sin of silence. And the watcher on the wall is warned. And here's the funny thing. People say, well, that's the Old Testament. That's in Ezekiel 33, watcher on the wall. No, it's not. The principle of watcher on the wall is actually carried over into the New Testament by the Apostle Paul in Acts 20 when he says, I am innocent of anyone's blood. And he was using watcher language from Ezekiel 33, being able to teach the whole counsel of God. That's exactly what he said. So what's happening is this sin of silence is a watcher mistake, watcher on the wall mistake. And the fact that they won't warn the flock and edify the flock to prepare for what's coming. So that's the overall general principle. So pastors are supposed to be watchers on the wall. Okay, so what's making them not do it? Well, as you highlighted, the church growth movement under Rick Warren and C. Peter Wagner and all the other church gurus said, look, the way you're going to build your church is don't talk about controversial issues, don't talk about eschatology, and don't talk about current events. And that's part of the mantra of having a purpose-driven, seeker-friendly church. Well, that's what a lot of people adopted. And yes, it's a formula. It does work because you're never offending anybody. You're never convicting anybody of anything. You cherry pick your way through the Bible and you pick out nice stories that don't offend anybody. But as you can see, that completely will have to ignore prophecy because prophecy gets rough. Right. And you have to ignore current events that sometimes are uncomfortable for people to realize. So what it actually does is puts Christians in a false security that nothing's happening. Everything's okay. And that's the disservice of the church growth movement. The other thing is nickels and noses, because here's the thing. They know that if they speak prophecy and they speak current events, they're going to thin out the crowd pretty quick. I thin out my own crowd every Sunday morning because of what I'm saying. But they don't want to pay that price. There comes a price with telling the truth. And these churches don't want it because the game for them is numbers and money. That's the real game that's being played in a lot of these churches, and that's why they say that. The other thing is ignorance. Ignorance, because number one, the seminaries are not teaching eschatology. It's very difficult to find a seminary now that requires you to study eschatology. And some of the seminary kids that were coming out of the Southern Baptist Convention seminaries, and I remember when I was in there, they would go through an entire seminary and never take an eschatology class. How is that possible? How is that possible? I don't understand It's unbelievable. You have that going on in seminaries. So a lot of these guys that are getting cranked out of the seminaries completely don't know how to study eschatology. I'm going to play a little clip of you here. And here, it's so true. Basically, what you're saying in this short clip I'm going to play is Bible prophecy prepares us. And the fact that we've probably entered a post-Christian society. So folks, how are you going to deal with that unless you really understand some of the issues that we're talking about this very hour? Prophecy is there to prepare us, to create an urgency in us, create righteousness and morality in us. And so if people, Christians in particular, think that, you know, we're going to get past all this and then we're going to return back to normal, they have a rude awakening coming. It's not ever going to return back to normal. We are in the last days. And that means every day, every week, every month, every year, as we get closer and closer to the tribulation, things are going to fundamentally change. Now, like I've always said, we could be raptured at any point in time, but think of how much we have seen now. Think of how much in the last two years we have seen even in America and around the world how things have fundamentally changed. The reason for it is because of prophecy. God is allowing evil to do what it wants to do 
so that eventually God will judge evil in the tribulation. So this is why we've seen the world change. This is why we've seen uh, the church be revealed for really what's going on. Now we understand in the church that there's a remnant element, and then there's a Laodicean element, and then there's an apostate element, and there's false teachings everywhere. So we now see that, which again was prophesied. But again, we have to understand as Christians to accept reality as it is, not to pretend it's not happening, not to go into a bubble and say, I don't want to hear anything, I don't want to see anything, uh, I just want to stay in my little bu protective bubble and pretend this is all not happening. That actually hurts you worse spiritually. You have to know what reality is and so that you can respond to it correctly, be about our Father's business, and realize you're now in a post-Christian society, a post-Judeo-Christian ethic and, and morals. The, you are now seeing Babylonian morals, 180-ism, as I call it, or lawlessness is now happening. We are in a post-freedom society. Whether you're in Canada, whether you're in South Africa, or, 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 or Australia, or any part of the Western society, or in, in, in uh, you know, Europe or whatever, that was part of Western society, you're now seeing that Western society's freedoms are, are, are being erased, are being taken from you, especially here in America. We are seeing things we never could have possibly imagined, and we see half of the population willing to give up their freedoms for quote-unquote security. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. If you join me late, I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Bakersfield, California, Pastor Brandon Holthouse. Learn more at rockharborchurch.net, and you might, if you're a remnant believer, and that's kind of what we're talking about, at least for this segment of the program. You might look into the remnant churches. He's identified 1,400 just about in every state of America. And Brandon, I think you've got some foreign countries too, right? Yeah, I do. We were picking up some foreign countries that we've made contact with and some pastors there. And yeah, we're expanding even the international. Okay, great. So again, you can find that at rockharborchurch.net and then look for the remnant churches. Is there anything else that identifies it to help them find it, Brandon? Just go to rockharborchurch.net, go to Grow and Connect, and then it'll say under that tab, Church Locator, and you'll pull up the whole map. And it's pretty easy to navigate. Grow and Connect, and then you'll find the Church Locator. And folks, if you have a remnant church, in other words, church that's telling the truth, that's talking about the things that we need to hear about these days, difficult as they would be, you might want to contact rockharborchurch.net. I played that little clip of you, Brandon. Anything you want to correct or embellish, go ahead. The big thing that people have to do in order to prepare themselves spiritually is just to accept reality, as I said on the clip. Because accepting reality means accepting the truth. And God wants us to be truth seekers. And what's happening to Christians is that because their lack of maturity or they've been in churches that haven't matured them, their discernment is not where it needs to be. So prophecy helps us increase our discernment about what's going on to prevent us from being deceived. Because right now, there's a lot of Christians that are deceived with like QAnon and other things that are giving out stories and fables or whatever that's deceiving them, and it's not true. So we're seeing now, because of a lack of prophecy teaching, a lack of discernment in Christian circles. And then when you start pointing things out to people and saying, hey, that's not even true. QAnon's fake. They get mad at you. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's like, look, I'm trying to help you. And prophecy would help you instead of you getting led astray by other things. And the game of deception is at an all-time right. high. This is why prophecy prepares us. It's not supposed to scare us. And that was often stated by our good friend, now enjoying heaven, Ed Heinsohn. That was one of the statements he always made. Prophecy is actually given to prepare us and certainly not to scare us. I have in front of me, Brandon, I have in front of me an article. It's actually published by Lifeway Research. A vast majority of pastors see signs of the end times in current events. Can't read it. It's many pages long. I can summarize it. Again, this is Lifeway Research. It says, are any of these types of current events birth pains that Jesus was referring to when he was asked by his disciples, when would he return? Again, Lifeway is asking pastors this. 
Then they come up with these categories, rise of false prophets, 83% of pastors agree. Love of many believers growing cold, 81% of pastors agree. These would be evangelicals primarily. Traditional morals becoming less accepted, 80% agree that we're there. Wars and national conflicts, again, almost 80% agree. Earthquakes and other national disasters, 76% of responders agree. The number of people abandoning their Christian faith, 75% of pastors agree. Famines, 70%. Anti-Semitism towards Jewish people worldwide, 63% of pastors agree. Now, I'm not going to go any further, but the point is almost 9 in 10 pastors see at least some current events matching those that Jesus said would occur shortly before he returns to earth. Again, this is according to a survey that focused on Christian eschatology or a study of the end times, and it was initiated and conducted uh, Nashville-based LifeWay Research. Brandon, in light of the fact we've spent about 20 minutes here talking about the fact that churches don't want to speak about these issues for a hundred different reasons. For now, we're not going to go there. There are a lot of reasons. But again, the pastors are acknowledging, at least those that participated in the poll, you know what, an awful lot that's going on on our earth right now, the Bible predicted, and yet I don't think they want to talk about it in the pulpit. Is it that interesting that you have all nine out of 10 say, yeah, there's end times birth pains, and yet Lifeway Research, the same research outfit that did that poll, did the other poll and said 98% of the pulpits are silent on eschatology and with only 2% saying something. So that is revealing and it tells you, okay, these pastors know it, Yes, they see it, but they commit the sin of silence. And everybody that sees this poll should say, why are they committing the sin of silence? It could be some of the things I pointed out, but it could be other things. But at the end of the day, we are in the biggest time of the most convergence of events, and yet the pastors are silent. I don't get it. I totally agree, and I use the quote from Bill Koenig so often. We are in the most significant time in the history of the world, and significant for the church at the same time because of how events that were foreshadowed in the Bible— Events that are going to blossom in the tribulation are casting their shadow on the church age, and yet, again, they don't really want to deal with it. And I think it goes back to the fact that it's going to scare people away. And you acknowledge yourself, Brandon, that you scare some people away. I do all the time. Whether it's online or in person, people get up and leave. The big thing that they want to accuse people in eschatology of, you're just being political. You're being political. Well, how is abortion political? How is talking about Israel political? Because these are Bible tenets, and the fact that how is prophecy political? Just because prophecy is going to talk about how things develop, that doesn't make me political, but that's always their out. You're political. And the fact that I shouldn't be saying those kind of things because it upsets people, or I shouldn't be out there condemning the transgender movement, which is wanting to mutilate kids. Mm -hmm. Well, if I don't say it, who is? This is where I can't understand the sin of silence and even on moral issues. And it's like they've taken one side of Christianity where it's all love, but there's no holiness, there's no justice, there's no righteousness. And so us that speak into the world of prophecy, we talk about those things, and we get lambasted from other Christians. Christians are my own problem. It's not the outside world. Yeah. It's Christians saying, you're yeah. being hateful and condemning. Really? To say abortion's wrong is hateful and condemning? I don't know where you're coming from. So going back to this survey... And again, it's many pages long. I'm just reading literally a few lines. It says more than half of pastors, 56%, expect Jesus to return in their lifetime. Now, that is astounding. 56% of pastors expect Jesus to return in their lifetime, according to this LifeWay survey of many, many churches. Again, and yet they probably won't talk about it from the pulpit again. Sin of silence, another couple of paragraphs, perhaps due in part to these beliefs, 89% of evangelical pastors say that communicating the urgency of Christ's return is important, okay, but we're not doing it. So one more line here, it says, seven in 10 evangelicals say that the modern rebirth of the state of Israel and the regathering of millions of Jewish people were fulfillments of prophecies in the Bible. 
So I see this as bittersweet, Brandon, because I'm glad to know that this belief system certainly is out there. And again, folks, we aren't saying every church doesn't get it. Many churches do. It's just too many don't. And again, with this kind of a poll, and yet the emails, I mean, I could read many emails. I actually have several of them in front of me. I'll read one more here, and then our time is winding down. It sounds very similar to the email I read a few minutes ago. And this person, not going to name them because I don't have their permission, just said, in September of 2022, I began listening to your archived radio shows via your website using my iPhone. I have listened to all of 2022 to date, and now I'm on 2021, starting in that order. Thank you so much. What a picture all these radio programs have provided. He goes on to say, I've studied Revelation and Daniel, and since 2016, I've picked up works by Terry James, Dave Reagan, Billy Crone, Bill Koenig, and many more. And then he concludes this email, there is so much to know, and then he says, no one wants to discuss these things with me. Again, similar to the email I read earlier. Brandon, I'm down to literally two minutes. If you want to wrap it up, it's all yours. So here's what I'm seeing on the ground. Because these pastors know it and won't teach it, here's what's happening. It's happening at the grassroots level. So this is what gets reported to me from our church tracker people throughout the nation. Their pastor agrees with them, actually. They go to their pastor, and he believes in a proper eschatology. He believes we're in the last days, but he won't teach it. So what a lot of people have done, and we've told them this, we're going to go start your own Bible study and study the book of Revelation, study the book of Daniel. We'll supply you with the supplies and whatever you need, and you do it on your own. And that's actually what's happening to a lot of churches that won't teach eschatology. It's happening from the grassroots okay. level. So, hey— if that's what needs to happen, then my encouragement to everyone out there listening, start your own Bible study and do it. There you go. I'm glad you said it because that's exactly what should be happening. Brandon, thank you for all you do. Let me just quickly add here that Brandon was our guest, Understanding the Times, last April. That's also on our website. If you just go to video, that's where we house the various things that we do on video, including our Thursday night, every other month, Understanding the Times events. He was with us in April. There we dwelt on the approaching New World Order. So again, it was extremely timely and relevant, and you can learn much more at rockharborchurch.net. Again, you might want to look for that church tracker on his website, rockharborchurch.net. Again, thank you, Brandon, for all you do. We appreciate it so much. I'm going to actually go out of the program just giving a couple of Bible verses because you know what? We have talked about some troubling things, particularly first half of the program as it concerns current events. So let's be comforted by the words out of Isaiah 41:10. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And the wonderful words, Psalm 3, 5, and 6. I lay down and I slept. I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. So I want to thank you for listening, folks, and we will talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. We encourage you to always look up and not around if you are to remain hopeful. Events foretold in the Bible are breaking daily. We can run from reality or recognize that God is allowing these events to take place so that everything will fall into place. <laughs>